at the end. At the very end, which tells you the kind of movie it is. Yes, well, listeners don't like us giving away the It turns out that what you thought were two people are really... We get more emails about plot spoiling than anything else, so I think we'll leave it there. The Street of Good Children, Certificate 15, is showing in selected cinemas now. And by coincidence, that thriller takes its title from one of the best-known paintings of our next subject, the artist Anderson Perrine. Born in Washington, D.C. in 1932 to an Anglo-French mother and an American father, Perrine emerged in the early 1960s as one of the most accomplished painters of the generation that followed Matisse and Braque. Although he's relatively unusual in having changed style dramatically, from figurative portraits and landscapes to abstraction, in middle career in the mid-80s. We don't know why, because strikingly against the spirit of the cultural age, Perrine has never given an interview. Indeed, the only photo of him that exists is from a college yearbook. The major new retrospective for Tate Modern, curated by Perrine's longtime friend and rumoured posthumous biographer, mm-hmm. Professor Augustus Black, features work from across his career. But even before it officially opens, the show is proving controversial. We're joined now in the studio by the young art well, historian. Well, thank you. <laughs> Well, by the standards of art historians, you are. Uh, I suppose. By the young art historian, Dr Emmy Callaghan, who in a series of articles and lectures has questioned Professor Black's interpretation of Anderson Perrine's work and career. Dr Callaghan. Emmy, please. The new Tate exhibition is called Perrine Revealed, but you've argued that the title should be Perrine Concealed. Why? Well, I think Professor Black has constructed a screen as thick as the layers of oil in some of the paintings, in front of what Anderson Perrine did and what the pictures really tell us. The distinguished historian insists that the work has no hidden meanings. Quite he, so. Emmy, <laughs> no, Emmy. He even uses that dreadful cliché, what you see is what you get. I completely disagree. I believe that the paintings of Anderson Perrine tell a story of love, sex, death and even possibly murder. Well, let's not get into that at the moment. Um, Craig, having seen a preview of the exhibition and heard what Dr Callaghan has said, what's your view? I think what she says is complete balderdash, <laughs> frankly. I think the key to Perrine, as Professor Black has argued, is that there isn't some hidden code written in invisible paint on the canvas. Look at what's there. The brush strokes, the perspective, the, uh, the Da Vinci Code was rubbish enough, but her attempt to write the Perrine Code is even worse. Another friend of Professor Black's, I take it. That's cheap. Although, no, actually, I, I, I have to say... Professor Lucas. Yeah, well, I, I did wonder, Dr Callan, if you might be vulnerable to the suspicion of being an enemy of Professor Black's. Absolutely. Were you a disgruntled student under him somewhere? I'm not quite sure what you're suggesting. I've never <laughs> well, even met him. In fact, if you really understood the subject, you know that almost no-one has. The critic is almost as reclusive as the artist. And, and on that point... Professor Lucas. Um, Anderson Perrine is indeed, I suppose, a sort of artistic J.D. Salinger, <laughs> given his chosen obscurity. What do we learn about him here? Well, I thought this was a really extraordinary exhibition. Yes. No, no. But I also think t- Professor Black is wrong in his captions and the essays in the catalogue. I mean, the fascination with Perrine is that every picture is a mystery. Even the apparently representative canvases are in some sense abstract because of the amount he withholds. Absolutely, and Professor Black exacerbates that problem. The curator Mm. knows more than he's letting on, which he could tell us in captions and simply chooses not to. He operates as a sort of artistic bodyguard blocking the way. Why should great art (laughs) just explain itself? I urge anybody interested in great art to get down to the tapes. Where Perrine Revealed runs until November the 22nd. And Emmy, you're giving a lecture at the gallery this week. Absolutely. It's called Perrine, The Death of Meaning and the Meaning of Death. At Wednesday, 5.15pm. We'll be back next week. Goodbye. Excuse me. Yes, madam. We've just seen the Perrine exhibition and there was a sign on the wall about a talk. That's right about the news. So let's just start seeing five minutes in room one. You've still got time. Your tickets to the exhibition give you free entry to the talk. Oh, thank you. Have you got the tickets? Oh, I gave them to you. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm not too late for the Perrine talk, am I? Not at all. Have you seen the exhibition? Well, I know his work extremely well. Do you have your ticket? Oh, I didn't see the show today. You'll need to get another ticket then. Really? People pay to hear her, do they? Sir? <laughs> Start shortly at 5.15pm. That's also...
Young lady? Yes. Is there a lot of walking on this tour? Just my husband has MS. I concentrate on a dozen or so paintings across the show. A wheelchair service is available. I don't want a chair. We'll risk it. We owned a Perrine once, you know. But so, when the market was low, more's the pity. Really? Oh, which one? One of the you set. One where she's smiling? An early sketch, not the oil. They say Madonna owns that now. Really? That's a very important picture to me. We'll just wait for any stragglers and begin. Uh, Dr. Callan. Yes. I'm not sure whether to join the tour. Oh, I'll try to make it worth your while. Sparing my feelings, what are the pros and cons? Well, uh, there's already an audio guide to the show they give you at the door on those sort of deaf loops. Yes. Which I've used. Well, not being rude, but why do we need this as well? Ah, oh, well, the recorded commentary is, if you like, the official version by the curator, Augustus Black. But during the run of the show, the gallery invites other voices to speak. I think it's fair to say I take a very different view from Professor Black. Oh, well, that sounds interesting. I certainly hope so. Ah, I think this is the last of our group. Are you here for the talk, sir? That is what it looks like, doesn't it? <laughs> OK, good. Sir, even with the air conditioning, it can be a little warm. If you wanted to leave the coat and scarf in the cloakroom. Oh, I'm happy like this. OK. Should we start? If you follow me into room one. We begin with this picture. Do come closer if you want to look. In thick, ridged swathes of paint, somewhere between post-impressionism and the drip technique of Jackson Pollock, we see a violent incident, a bomb exploding. Do we suspect that we can even make out body parts arcing through the air? Is it terrorists again? Well, I don't know about again. It predates most of the events you may be thinking about. I'll tell you in a moment. This is the earliest professional work credited to Anderson Perrine. The curator, Professor Black, dates it to Paris in 1953, when the artist would have been 21. And do you agree with him on that? What? Oh. I was explaining to the gentleman just now that I differ with this particular art historian, distinguished scholar of Perrine that he is, on certain issues. But he is generally reliable on dates and places. So, painted in Paris in 1953, Perrine is largely living in Paris at this time, having graduated from Harvard because his father, J. Hubert Perrine, has been appointed U.S. Ambassador to France in the first Eisenhower oh. administration. Oh. The picture references a late 19th century act of terrorism. Uh, did they have it then? Oh, yes. And then, as well, the argument was over terms. The bomber, Emile Henri, calls himself an anarchist, a revolutionary. On November the 8th, 1892, he places an explosive device in Paris at the building occupied by the Carmo Mining Company. It doesn't go off. Ah, but in the painting, it does. Wait. The bomb is found and taken to the nearest police station in La Rue des Bons Enfants. But before it can be disabled, it explodes, killing five policemen. At his trial, accused of threatening the lives of innocent bourgeoisie, he replies, there is no such thing as an innocent bourgeois. Emile Henri is hanged. His final words, courage, comrade, vive l'anarchy. Courage, comrades, let anarchy live. Oh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, yes, indeed. <clears throat> but you can imagine how provocative this subject matter is for the son of a serving official in the American Republican Why do you people do that? Do what? Use the present tense. 1953 is a time four million workers participate. <sighs> they do it all the time in Radio 4. Germany invades Czechoslovakia. No, it's all past. These people are dead. Well, Anderson Perrine isn't dead yet. <laughs> Makes it sound like you want to kill him. What? I, I don't think so. To go back to your point, sir, if we use the present tense, it's been called the historian's present, it's because, I suppose, it makes the past seem more alive, immediate, important. Ah, I see. 
But what we do definitely know about the Street of Good Children is this. Clearly, in making this painting, the artist is thinking of his father. For what more prominent representative could there be of the uninnocent bourgeoisie, in Emile Henri's terms, than Ambassador J. Hubert Perrine? Sir, you're shaking your head very emphatically. Oh, am I? Yes, like a dog after a rainstorm. I'm worried I said something to upset you. Oh, I wouldn't want you to think that. I think this picture reveals the true spirit of Anderson Perrine. I believe that, crucially, throughout his career, he has remained an anarchist. Outside of the laws. The laws of art, you mean? Outside the law. The next picture I want us to consider is in room three. Catalogue number 14. Oil on canvas. 33 by 38 inches. 83.8 by 96.5 centimetres. Title, Portrait. Dated... 1971. This picture holds considerable historical fascination as the single male portrait among Perrine's extant paintings. All other images of recognizable faces are female, including the 13 that seem to show the same young woman who has never been identified. I will discuss in detail the images of her in room 7. Some uninformed and artistically uninteresting speculation has suggested that this painting may depict the artist himself. Surely, though, Perrine does not want the viewer of this portrait to ask of the artist, is this you, but rather to inquire, is this me? By which I mean, of course, you, the one you who... You don't like to follow me through here? Oh. Sir, sir? Yes, what? Uh, yeah, but, uh, let me turn this down. Sir, obviously it's up to you, but it's not very usual to listen to the audio guide while also following a live lecture. Well, <laughs> as you've acknowledged yourself, they are such contradictory opinions. As I say, it's up to you. Look, I've switched it off. I wait with interest what you have to say about this painting. Can we all gather round again? It's impossible to discuss the work of Anderson Perrine without using the word mystery. There are a few major artists about whom so little is known. The few details we have are those that Professor Black chooses to release. Indeed, in this respect, he might aptly be nicknamed Professor Black Out. <laughs> but this picture is among the most mysterious of all, although I believe that I have solved its mystery. This is Portrait, from 1971. Perrine is 39 and dividing his time between Paris and New York. Where... There you go again. Perrine is 39. He isn't. He's... Born in 1932, so... 79. Thank you. Sir, it, it's a manner I have of speaking. I'm sorry if it makes you... Tense? Uh, yes. Perrine is 39 and dividing his time between Paris and New York when he paints portrait. As you see, it shows an adult male in early middle age of medium build, the signs of male pattern baldness and of greying apparent at the temples. The left eye, look, here shows signs of the condition called amblyopia, or colloquially, lazy eye. This malfunction of the optical nerves and muscles is commonly caused by strabismus, or the absence of proper binocular vision. Dr. Callahan, this is the language of the autopsy slab, not of art appreciation. My approach has certainly been forensic, sir. Enjoy the paradox of an artist with a lazy eye an apparent professional disqualification. You're saying the man in this painting is an artist? More than that, the artist, Anderson Perrine. Oh, oh. For decades, academic study of Perrine has been fascinated by the possibility that he is tricking our eye. His work contains examples of most of the classic genre of artistic depiction, but there is a specific gap, no self-portrait. We have no idea of what the artist looks like, beyond the disputed high school yearbook photograph, which some have argued may have substituted the image of another student. An early mischievous bid for anonymity by the artist. And so, the possibility has always existed that portrait may be an unacknowledged self-portrait. Professor Black is quite insistent that it isn't. Isn't he? He tells us that the man is most likely an unidentified model with whom Perrine worked in a number of studio sessions at the turn of the 1970s. With respect, this felt a little unscientific. 
And so, I applied science. As you may be aware, art history has, in recent years, increasingly used techniques from forensic medicine and police detection. I commissioned a laboratory to compare forensically portrait with a yearbook photo from the 1940s. Through measurements and physical projections, the report concluded that the images are of the same person. Portrait is a self-portrait of Anderson Perrine. <laughs> the guy in the yearbook photo doesn't have the eye thing. Absolutely. And nor, if we saw Anderson Perrine today, would he have it now. I thought I was going to get the South Bank show, and this is, what's it called, silent witness? <laughs> <laughs> it's a feature of amblyopia that the condition can be medically corrected in childhood, after which procedure, I believe, the yearbook photograph was taken. But the correction can, in severe cases, be temporary, with recurrences in adulthood, as shown in Portrait 1971. And how? Although we seem far beyond art criticism here, can you be sure that he would now be seeing straight again? During my research on Perrine, I contacted one of America's leading specialists in corrective eye surgery. It was my hope, of course, to find out if he had treated the artist. As I had feared, physician-patient confidentiality made it impossible for him to help me, except in guidance about the generalities of the condition. But leaving his Fifth Avenue consulting rooms, I idly thought, surgeons with artistic masterpieces on the walls? Would you even get that in Harley Street? And then I thought I needed my eyes testing. I was looking straight at Split Personality, 1985. One of the earliest abstracts. Uh, is that in this show? No. Which is the point. Shown only once in the MoMA retrospective in 86, it has never been offered at sale and therefore was presumed to remain in the artist's collection or in private hands. My hypothesis is that it was given as a gift to Dr. R. Wilson Hardacre by a grateful patient. It's yeah. clever, but essentially argumentative. My husband's an attorney. Retired, but he still likes to solve the murders in the newspapers. Even if it was a thank you to the doc. The patient doesn't have to be the artist. He could have been a perine collector with a squint. <laughs> My point. Criticism is about what you see. What I see here, and what I saw in that Manhattan waiting room, convince me that in Portrait 1971, we are looking into the eyes, what used to be the eyes, of Anderson Perrine. Now, could we all head to room seven? Catalogue numbers 64 to 76. Oils on canvas. All 56 by 56 centimetres, 22 and an eighth by 22 and an eighth inches. The 13 female portraits in this room depict apparently the same woman in various stages of undress, apparent postcoital languor, and at what seem to be successive stages of pregnancy and then post childbirth. Each bears the title You, followed by the date of completion ranging from 1984 to 1985. Nothing is known about who the woman is, and the artist's choice of the word, you, an English echo of the intimate French address, tu, a likely deliberate reference to his bilingual dual location upbringing, may well be intended to challenge the viewer to ask not, who was this, but... Everyone OK? Yes. My it husband is. only came because Everyone. I told him the news. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, I argue that the U series of portraits are at the heart of what Perrine does and is. I want to start with the earliest picture, dated 1984. We see a young woman of perhaps 24 lying on a white sheeted bed, her head and back supported by a large, comfortable pillow. She is, at this stage, herself largely concealed by the bed covering, but the first four paintings in the series have the progress of a slow striptease. Here, in the second, one breast. The third, both. We think perhaps of teenagers marking the stages of dating, bases, numbers. By U4, as I may call it for convenience, the model's pudenda are visible. We may think that these portraits are the report of a seduction. By the fifth picture, the woman's legs are parted with, are we being too prurient to suspect this in the texture of the paint? Clear signs of recent sexual activity. And if it has taken place, then it has achieved, in canvases five through nine, its frequent consequence. At least, 
for those who have for those who have no protection. These pictures are particularly moving. <sighs> they do mean a lot to me. I'm sorry. I'll Come on. <clears throat> it's only art. Miss. Yes. Ma'am. On the card here, the guy says that the title you may encourage us to ask, who was this? Yes. Is he saying the lady's dead? That's very clever. <laughs> Why, thank you. If we look again at paintings five to nine, the model, as you will see, is progressively pregnant. And we may think increasingly confident in posing for Perrine. By the ninth painting, her swollen belly is held proudly outwards, the breasts triumphantly plump. This portrait is believed to have been an influence on Annie Leibovitz's Vanity Fair cover photo of a naked, pregnant Demi Moore. That was disgusting. This is art. Oh, these distinctions are not always easy. Did he tend to have a thing with the women who sat for him? Like Lucian Freud? Freud isn't really my area. Well, Professor Black has accused me of an over-devotion to the ideas of Sigmund, but that's different. <laughs> If we move now to the corner of the gallery that holds the 10th, 11th, and 12th pictures. We do not need to be midwives or gynaecologists to see that the model has given birth. With the graphic physicality that some of his critical detractors have found so off-putting, Perrine depicts the strii, uh, colloquially stretch marks, here and here. Her abdomen, though, is impressively slender again. Did she perhaps feel under pressure from the father of the child to return as quickly as possible to the body he had been so keen to capture? Capture? In paint. How could we possibly know the relationship between artist and model? This is absurd. You sound like an agony art, not a critic. <laughs> Paintings tell stories. Even abstract pictures, I will argue, in the next and final room. Classical artists. For example, the Dutch Vanitas school in the 17th century nudged the eyes of their audience. And the story told by portraits 10 <clears throat> through 12 in the U series is that of a failing relationship. Note how the model's eyes are increasingly withheld and resentful. Her body as well. The legs are firmly closed in all three of these later paintings. A stark contrast to the satisfied akimbo of portrait five and the ecstatically unbuttoned pregnancy of the ninth picture. But I want you to look most closely at the final image in the sequence. OK. Uh, OK, but I just noticed something. In a moment, sir. This last picture of the unnamed model belongs to the artistic genre known as double portraits, one of the best known of which is the Arnolfini portrait, dated 1434 by Van Eyck. Note how the subject now has the white sheet pulled up almost to her nose. And yet, as I will argue, this absence of nakedness in some sense makes the image less innocent. But reflected in the window, there she is again. At an artistic level, a reference is almost certainly intended to Freud's 1967 picture, Interior with Hand Mirror. Although, characteristically of Perrine, it is not the artist we see. What? though, does the second image of the woman represent? Is she a memory? A ghost? A bird, a plane? Oh, oh, don't be so rude. This is fascinating. There is another possibility. The female subject has herself recently been doubled by giving birth. If the child were a female, there is a strong genetic likelihood that the daughter will grow up to resemble her mother. So the reflection might be the shadow child. But in fact, I believe it is another and different doubling of the mother. Anderson Perrine is not averse to an occasional game with classical iconography. Though Professor Black continues to insist that a rose is a rose is a rose. <laughs> but look now in the topmost corner of the window in U13, just above the reflection. What do you see? Oh. It looks like a butterfly. In the Vanitas tradition, a butterfly represented the departing soul of a dead person. In a modern portrait, painted in the middle of the Reagan administration, a memento mori. The artist is thinking of his dead muse. It is my contention that if Perrine named his paintings more descriptively, 
The title of this one might have been those two most haunting words from Hamlet. Poor ghost. Uh, sir, hmm? there was something you wanted to point out? I don't know if this is anything, but the pillow's gone. <sighs> the gentleman is correct. The thirteenth painting in the U sequence, certainly unlucky we might observe for its subject, differs from the other dozen in that the model is now dead and the pillow is gone. Can we make our way, please, to our final room? Okay. One of the central mysteries of Perrine's work is why, after 1985, his artistic practice completely changes. In fact, there are two changes. The next year, he exhibits for the first and only time in his career a sculpture of the human form in the classical style, a representation of Venus, the Roman goddess of love and beauty. But for once, I agree with Professor Black, who declined to include it in this retrospective, calling it a false trail. The sculpture is an oddity, a dead end. The truly important departure for Perrine was his shift into abstraction. It is not unknown for an artist to move between figurative and abstract styles. We think of Joanne Miro and Philip Guston, among others. But the switch in this case is among the most sudden and permanent. As a matter of interest, can I just ask if there is anyone here who prefers these paintings to the earlier work? Well, I mean, I can never make them out. They're like a sample chart at the paint store. Exactly. I, I like to know what a painting's about. That's fair enough. In most cases, a work of art that tells a clear and recognisable story will be preferred to one that is harder to understand. Perhaps because to be alive is to be in a narrative where we know the final sentence, but not the page on which it will fall. But if we can learn to look at them, abstract pictures can also unfold a compelling narrative. Can be a ripping yarn especially as Perrine follows the practice of artists such as Howard Hodgkin, who combine ambiguous images with strongly specific titles. So, if we look here at Crime and Punishment, with its savage conversation between blocks of red, it is reasonable to infer that the artist is thinking of something he has done, something about which he feels guilt. Mightn't he just have read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment? or seen it on TV. <laughs> That's good. Or uh, over here at Sorry Doesn't Help, with its undulating waves of pink and dark green, that the artist is again thinking of past actions which he is unable to reverse. You keep saying this. The artist is thinking. How do you know what the artist is thinking? You're only a critic. I think you'd be well within your rights to ask him to leave the it's tour. It's fine. Anyone who takes a different line to Professor Black knows what it's like to be disagreed with. Just two points, sir. I'm not a critic. I'm an art historian. We do more research. And we can know what an artist is thinking because every work of art is, at some level, a confession. No. Yes. And, and while we're on the subject of Professor Black, he, not untypically, has asserted that no colour code is in operation in these pictures. But of all my disagreements with him, this is perhaps the most fundamental. Observe a common factor in these paintings that have titles hinting at some sort of guilt or contrition. For example, Crime and Punishment, and Sorry Doesn't Help, but also The Years After, and Invisible Birthdays. Two particular colours fill these canvases. A pink and a dark, dark green. That perhaps makes us check the calendar to be sure that it isn't St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Each of these pigmentations is a character, a trail of DNA. It is my contention that the model in the U paintings, now dead, was called Rose, and that her daughter, who I believe to be alive, was named Emerald. Oh, wow. And the canvas over there that is filled with greens and blacks is the artist secretly confessing an addiction to organic chocolate? I am convinced that Perrine's change of style was a kind of disguise, an artistic version of the corrective surgery, which, as I have said, I believe that he also underwent. Abstraction, for him, is a covering of the tracks, 
A smudged fingerprint. Um, and let me get this clear. Are you saying that Perrine murdered Rose? With the pillow. Your case is mainly circumstantial, but I know judges in Florida that would find for you. Uh, ah, <laughs> no. The artist is alive, as far as we know. As is his assiduous sidekick, Professor Black, who has more than once launched libel actions or injunctions against critics and academics who question the authorised version. So I will say only that Anderson Perrine is haunted by the death of Rose, his model and sometime mistress. In much of his later work, the artist is thinking of her. The gallery will be closing in five minutes. Huh. Will all visitors please make okay. their way towards the exit? As you hear, we must leave it there. Well, that was terrific, Dr. Callahan. Is there a book of yours we can buy in the store? Not at the moment. All being well, I plan to publish next year. You need to find the daughter, don't you? It is very much her story. If he hasn't killed her as well. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm sorry about the music. You have nothing to be sorry about. <laughs> For a young woman of your age, it must be boring. But I've always painted to that background. Now, could you m move your head a little um, to the left on the pillow? Okay, like that? Yes. And perhaps widen the gap between your knees. Okay. <laughs> we may have to interrupt the sitting. Are you expecting visitors? There was a possibility. Yes, hello? Uh, Professor Black? Who is that? Amy Callahan. Good. Sixth floor, apartment H. Um, my dear, um, uh, can, can you dress in the bedroom and leave by the rear stairs? I'll, I'll contact you about our next sitting. Mm. Mm. I was hoping to stay the night. Oh, we'll have many other nights. <laughs> I hope so. Mm. No, 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 I have to wash my hands. Spoil sport. Hello? <laughs> Professor Black? Good evening, Professor Black. <laughs> Dr. Callahan. Ah. It was you. I knew it. The grumpy guy at my lecture. I thought it had to be. Who would get so angry at an attack on an academic except the professor himself? Did you summon me here to put me right? <laughs> Something like that. Wow. Double whammy. Mm -hmm. This is Perrine's studio. The bed and pillow. The bed's showing the evidence of a recent body. Really? Does that mean he's returning to figuratism? Or does he use models for the abstracts? <laughs> we never discuss work in progress. Look, tell me, I, d I don't understand about you. You have the dream of every art historian to watch a great artist at work. And yet your catalogue essays and your, and your captions, they couldn't, I'm not being rude, <laughs> say much less about him if you'd never met him. <laughs> well, uh, Perrine and I are as one in believing the art should speak for itself. <laughs> if anyone does speak about it, then that should be the artist. But lectures and autobiographies by artists, even interviews with them, are so often disappointing. They're standing too close to the canvas. Artists don't know what they're doing. Really? <laughs> uh, have you uh, considered the possibility that they know perfectly well, but they... <laughs> Don't want other people to know. And look, over here, the Venus statue. Almost no one has ever seen this. Well, yeah, that's true. How fascinating. I've always wondered, is it marble or, or fiberglass? Don't touch it! Okay. Sorry. He really lucked out with you, didn't he? The perfect guardian of his work. Mm. Wait. Your hands. And Terps coming off you like perfume. <laughs> of course, you use Black's name when you wrote to me because Anderson Perrine doesn't send letters. But you are him, aren't you? You have an impressive record of understanding which is the in front of you. And you are her. 
Who? Emmy. <laughs> so you kept the name I gave you. My adoptive parents shortened it. I actually quite liked Emerald. Are all your love children called after colours? Will I chat with Ruby and Primrose and Violet at your funeral? Would you be there? Is this uncomfortable for you? Do I remind you of her? There is a definite likeness. Oh, the quality by which the banal judge portrait painted. Oh, this is epic. When I started writing articles and teaching classes on him, on you, I imagined Anderson Perrine reading about them, or more likely being told by his faithful mutt, Black. But the other day at the gallery, <laughs> I was giving a talk on Perrine, to Perrine. Yes, I have to say it was smart stuff. The you paintings as a portrait of a relationship. Do you begin to understand what that was like? How many children, I used to wonder, end up studying the swollen belly in which their mother is carrying them? Yes. <laughs> and so sharpen the later work as well. A smudged fingerprint. <laughs> Very good. I suppose I didn't really understand how much I was giving away. You couldn't stop yourself. Mm. I don't mean when mm. you killed her. Mm. Although that too. Mm. But in the pictures... A great artist, and you and I agree that you are that, can't help giving it away. The truth has to be told, somehow. Yes. Censorship, internal or external, is the death of art. How did you find out about Rose? The usual story. My birth mother, when I was adopted, had left a packet to be opened on my 21st birthday. It had her details and two pencil-on-paper drawings. I was studying history of art. Jeans, I suppose. And so I recognised them for what they were, sketches for the U series. My mum had left a photo of herself. I tried to find her, and when I discovered that she had disappeared, in 1985, it was a matter of building up the picture. A six-year research project. Funded by selling those two sketches, Mum left me. I could never understand how those drawings reached the market. I needed the money. No university will employ me. My views on Perrine being so heretical. I work and live in isolation, pretty much. There is no one in your life? For some reason. I seem to have trouble trusting men. Look, on the subject of trust, I've always wondered why Professor Black doesn't kill you. <laughs> A macabre speculation. Why? You're almost exactly the same age. His embargoed biography of you, which people say is in at least two volumes, Three. can only appear by agreement when you're dead. That is the deal. Which academic could bear the possibility of not living to see the publication of his life's work. <laughs> that remark may tell us more about your autobiography than his biography. But by killing you, he'd get the lead review in the New York Times review of books, the nominations for the Pulitzers, the royalty. Being suffocated with a pillow by the professor <sighs> is something I've never had to worry about. Ah, a confession. Wait, two confessions. <sighs> of course. When I arrived tonight, I thought you were the professor. And you are. That's why you both have to be recluses and the gallery gets an actor to record the audio guide. Oh, I should have got that. Your black side. Your alter ego. Of course. I must go back and look at the monochrome abstracts again. Uh, once I determined to control the interpretation of my work, it was the only way. If I'd employed an actual critic, they might have got it wrong or seen too much. <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't asked why I killed her. I'm a critic. I know why you killed her. I hardly need to check it out with you. Of course. But go on. What's your version? What happened with my mum? She wanted to keep the child. I didn't. Thanks. In the aftermath, we increasingly argued. The artist must be solitary, free. Lovers, still more, when they become mothers, disagree. 
This is an inevitable conflict. Oh, well, don't shag your models, then. <laughs> Uncanny. <laughs> you have the first year. Uh, uh, most couples meet in the workplace. This is mine. Rose was very special for a while. But I had no desire to paint the same subject for the rest of my life. So there were others, and... The pillow was the murder weapon? The Desdemona death, huh. yes. And her body slipped into the river at the dead of night. Oh, no, 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 it might have been found. No, even a critic as perceptive as you miss this. The single thing, wasn't it, on which you agreed with Professor Black? Hmm? A false trail? A statue? The Venus? Oh, my God! Oh. I never hugged my mother. I have to admit to a quiet thrill. When the critics condemned my move into statuary as conservative, well, actually, it was a pretty radical project. So what happens now? <laughs> the artist is thinking. It's immoral and upsetting, and it simply shouldn't be allowed. 14 and Divorced is on ITV4 at 9pm. We move on to an unexpected exhibition. Anderson Perrine has always been a surprising artist, and just days after the end of a major retrospective at Tate Modern, he's opened a show of new work at a small London gallery. Perrine has returned for the first time in almost 30 years to figurative representation, with what looks to be another picture of the U model. The other canvases are abstract, continuing Perrine's recent practice of applying narrative titles, A Lazy Eye, The Desdemona Death and The Silent Professor, to pictures which again make bold and prominent use of rectangles of pink and dark green paint. Professor Lucas. I, I thought this was an extraordinary show. A golden coda, you might say, to what we saw so recently at the Tate. It's quite clear to me that these pieces are an allegory for the Iraq War. Oh. The picture called The Silent Professor, a reference to the weapons expert... That is and... nonsense. Absolute well, nonsense. Craig. I keep saying the pictures are not mysteries. They are simple, declarative statements in paint. So at least this time we don't have that young art historian woman... Dr Emmy Callaghan. ...pointing out shapes in the clouds. She's very quiet on this exhibition. Maybe she's seen the error of our ways. Well, actually, we couldn't contact her. One work I didn't mention in the introduction is one of the first things we see as we go in. A sculpture of the female form. Only the second in Perrine's career, apparently. And he shouldn't have done either of them. It's a dead end for him. Of course, because he's a great artist, he gets away with it. But what we are looking at there is an artist getting away with it. <laughs> 